brand in their hands and herbs to make to smoke as they are accustomed to do. Unquote. With these words, Christopher Columbus made the first reference to tobacco smoking among the natives of the new islands they explored. Columbus and some companions had landed on one of the islands and were walking about exploring. They called the, the natives called the herb tobaccos. The natives rolled the dried herb in dried palm or mice leaves. They lit one end and drew in the smoke with their mouths, smoking the herb until it made them drowsy or drunk. The natives claimed that smoking the herb cured any fatigue they felt. This was not Columbus's first contact with tobacco. On October the 12th, the first natives he encountered had given some as a gift. None of not one of his crew knew the purpose of the herb, and they discarded it. A member of Columbus's crew, Rodrigo de Jerez, bears credit for being the first European to smoke. De Jerez had took some tobacco back to Spain. The smoke surrounding his face when he smoked frightened people. Spanish authorities threw him in jail because, quote, only devil could give a man power to exhale smoke from his mouth, unquote. They imprisoned him for seven years, and by the time they released him, smoking tobacco had become fashionable. On November the 21st, 1492, the Pinata under Martin Alonso Pinzon separated from Columbus. Legend dances with history in the stories that chronicle the life of Martin Alonso Pinzon. Tales persist of his voyages with the French navigator Jean Cousin, whose claims of sighting the New World four years before Columbus remain unsubstantiated. He did supply a substantial portion of the money for the expedition and two of the ships, the Pinta and the Nina. Cousin, a native of deeper Normandy, lived in the mid to latter part of the 15th century. Several authors have published his books about his discoveries, including Francis Parkman. According to these stories, Cousin had sailed to the west coast of Africa in 1488. Fierce storms drew, drove him before them. When the storms died away, Cousin and his crew found themselves off the, coast of an, off the coast of an unknown land. He and his crew sighted a large river, which historians think was the South American River of the Orenco. At the conclusion of the voyage on their return to France, Cousin dismissed Pinzon for mutinous conduct during the voyage. Most of the information about this voyage was in the Deep Chronicles. The English destroyed the archives during their bombardment of the city in 1694, so any information about that voyage is lost. Martin Alonso Pinzon lived from 1441 through 1493, the eldest son of a, of a Spanish seafaring family in Palos de Morgo, Spain. Pinzon grew up a seaman. After the voyage with cousin Pinzon, retired from the seafaring life. During this time, some feel he heard, he heard of the Viking voyages early in the 10th and 11th century and studied accounts of them. Nevertheless, he learned of Columbus's quest and the, men made, and the men made acquaintance. Some reports say it was his favorable opinion about Columbus's venture to the Spanish king that and queen that convinced him that the voyage was a reasonable risk. When the expense of the voyage proved more than they were willing to make, Pinzon supplied part of the funds and two of the ships. He also worked among his friends and family of Palos de Morgo, convincing them to join the crew. Many reports state that Pinzon advised Columbus during the voyage and was always confident of his advice. It was Pinzon who advised Columbus to make a course change on October the 6th, making it possible for them to find land. Before reaching their destination, Pinzon and Columbus got on well, Columbus even promising to treat him like a brother upon their return to Spain. Once, in the Caribbean, things changed. The proclivity towards the insubordination that had troubled the voyage with Pinzon surfaced. He became uncooperative and independent. He had falsely claimed, at first, that he had been the first to sight land. The disagreements continued until November the 21st, 1492, when Pinzon disobeyed a course change by Columbus and sailed off on his own. Some say to discover more riches than he could claim as his own. On December the 25th, 1492, Columbus turned south. In doing so, he missed Florida. Convinced that his October the 28th landing on Cuba had put him on the mainland of Cathay, which he thought was China, Christopher Columbus continued exploring the Caribbean Sea south of Florida. He searched for the legendary city of Saiton, thinking that this city, filled with gold, spices, and other riches, lay to the south, Columbus changed course and sailed away from the Florida coast. He would leave the discovery of Florida to Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon. On December the 25th, 1492, the Santa Maria ran aground. Sometime during the early mornings of December the 25th, 
the Santa Maria ran aground off the course of Hispaniola. Columbus and his crew had spent a great deal of time exploring the island of Hispaniola. They found some gold and made contact with local Taino tribes that inhabited the island. As they lay off the shore of the island during the night of December 25th, the Santa Maria, Santa Maria ran aground on some offshore sandbars. Columbus and the crew of the Nina managed to rescue the crew of the Santa Maria, Santa Maria without losing a person. The ship had grounded firmly. He could not save it. The extra men from the ship would not fit on the Nina. Since Martin Alonso Pinzon had absconded with a pinta, Columbus had a decision to make. He decided to found a colony on Hispaniola and leave some of the crew to inhabit it. He consulted with the Taino chieftain, Guanacangari, excuse my bad pronunciation, who allowed Columbus to build a stockade. December the 26th, 1492, the first Spanish settlement in New World was founded by Christopher Columbus. The Santa Maria's grounding had presented Columbus with a problem and an opportunity. In the absence of the Pinta, the extra crewmen would not fit on the Nina. On Christmas Day, Columbus made a decision to found a settlement on Hispaniola, Hispaniola with the crewmen from the Santa Maria. By the next day, the crew members began breaking up the ship to use the lumber to build small settlement. Columbus and his crew would remain on Hispaniola, building the stockade using logs from the forest and lumber from the ship. He would leave 39 men behind. On January the 6th, 1493, Martin Alonso Penzola and Columbus reunited. The Pinta and the Nina reunited, reunited after the lookouts on both ships sighted each other. Apparently, it was not a happy reunion, as Pizon objected to Columbus leaving the 39 men on the men alone. An angry Columbus, who had already made the decision, threatened to hang Pinzon. After they had reunited, Pinzon men captured six natives, four men and two women. Since Columbus had claimed the area for Spain, he asserted that these natives were now citizens of Spain and that they must treat them honorably. He ordered Pinzon to release them. Columbus did not trust Pinzon, thus he decided to return to Spain and report his discoveries. The crew of the ships began gathering supplies for the return voyage. January the 9th, 1493, Christopher Columbus sees the first of the odd creatures that we now call manatees. In the final days of his first voyage of discovery, Christopher Columbus and his crew sailed through the waters near the Dominican Republic. As they sailed, he and his crew saw their first manatees, which they thought were mermaids. He recorded in his journal that he, quote, distinctly saw three mermaids which rose well out of the water but they are not so beautiful as they are said to be, for their faces had some masculine traits." Unquote. Relatives to the elephant and the hippopotamus, the manatee are a vegetarian that can live 50 to 60 years. They can grow to a length of 10 to 12 feet and can weigh as much as 1,200 pounds. The name manatee also means sea cows, derives from the Carib word manti, which means breast or udder. Manatees are the largest herbivore in the world and can consume 10 to 15 percent of their body weight in a single day. The animals live in coastal waters and have no natural predators. Their biggest threat in the modern civilization is boat collisions. January 16, 1493, Columbus set sail in the remaining ships, the Pinta and the Nina. They departed Samana Bay for the Azores. On February the 15th, 1493, half of Columbus's crew was imprisoned in the Azores Island. About four weeks into the return voyage, the returning Columbus and his two remaining ships entered, he encountered heavy seas. In a matter of hours, a terrible storm engulfed the ships. By February the 15th, the storms quieted. They saw islands a short distance away. Thinking they were the Spanish-controlled Canary Islands, Columbus anchored in a harbor. Instead of the Canaries, they had lit on the Portuguese-controlled Azores Islands. Instead of a refuge to try to repair their ships, Columbus found peril. On February the 12th, 1493, a storm had enveloped the, the two ships, the, Pin Pinto, the Pinta and the Nina. For several days, the wind and waves imperiled the two ships. At length, the storms uh, once again separated them. Thinking they would sink, Columbus wrote an account of the voyage, coated the parchment with wax to preserve it, had put the rolled up account in a bottle. He dropped the bottle overboard in hopes that if the ship perished, some account of their discoveries might survive. The entire crew pledged to attend mass if they survived the storm. They drew lots to decide who, which would go on a pilgrimage if the ship made shore. Columbus drew the lot and to go on the pilgrimage. The ship did not sink. Instead, the storm waned and the skies cleared. 
separated Pinzon and the Nina from Columbus. They would not meet again until the ships reached Spain independently. The exhausted crew dropped anchor in a harbor they thought was in the Canary Islands, and it was instead the Azores, part of the Santa Maria controlled by the Portuguese. The governor of the island was not happy to see them. Half of the crew went to mass to fulfill the vow they made. The governor of the island and a body of troops arrested them and imprisoned them. Columbus ship needed repairs badly because of the storm. Half of his crew was in jail. It just happened that it was the half of the crew that was his best sailors. Columbus left the island in despair and sailed around it. He found he needed the men that the governor had imprisoned, so he returned to the island. Using whatever means he had, he managed to get his crew released. With his crew replenished, but without the repairs, Columbus continued. Eventually, about the beginning of March, Columbus reached Lisbon, Portugal. A relieved Columbus departed the Portuguese port of Santa Maria in Orzores Island. He had rescued his crew from the imprisonment on the island and loaded them into the storm-battered ships. They put out to sea only to encounter another storm. The ships, already in disrepair from the first storm, almost foundered in the tumultuous waters. Columbus' ship, the Nina, limped into port at Portugal. Finding a harbor patrol boat in the harbor, Columbus anchored next to it. Columbus desired to talk to the king of Portugal, but King John II was not there. Columbus wrote a letter to him requesting an audience. The king agreed to meet him in a town north of Lisbon, Val de Pariso. He conferred with the king for about a week. During their conversation, word of Columbus's voyages leaked out. The news spread across Portugal, then Spain, like a wildfire. By the time Columbus departed Portugal, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella had heard his return, as had all of Spain. Christopher Columbus returned to Spain after his first voyage on March the 15th, 1493. After staying in Lisbon, Portugal for several days, Columbus set sail for Spain and entered the port of Palos on March the 15th, 1493. The Spanish have erected a 197-foot-tall monument, the Monument a Colón, in 1888 to commemorate Columbus's return. Because of the letter he had written, he found that news of his discoveries of new land spreading across Europe. During his return, the Nina... Columbus wrote a letter detailing the events of his voyage. This letter played an important part in spreading the news throughout Europe about his discoveries. He added a postscript on the letter upon his arrival in Lisbon and, according to his accounts, dispatched two copies. One went to Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabel I of Castile, the Spanish monarchs, that authorized his voyage. The other went to the Spain financial backer, Louis de Santagel. Many historians feel that he sent it from Lisbon's Others feel that he waited until a rival in Palos. At any rate, printers somehow obtained copies of the letter and printed versions began surfacing. These printed versions first surfaced in Spain, then throughout Europe. In Italy, the letter saw over 1,500 copies, making it a bestseller at the time. Listeners must remember that Columbus's voyage was a, Columb was a commercial venture. Columbus returned carrying no valuable cargo of any kind. It was imperative that he satisfy the voyage's investors. He had to convince them that though he had returned with few goods, the land he found had immense potential. He wanted to mount further expeditions and needed financial backing to do so. Thus, he glossed over many things and exaggerated many others. He did not say that he had lost to Santa Maria, only that he had left it in the colony established on Hispaniola. He stressed the suitability for the islands he discovered for colonization. He attempted to build the case for further expeditions throughout the letter. The concept of colonization for profit was a novel idea at the time. Several European countries had overseas colonies, but the practice was not yet widespread. In the letter, Columbus implied the existence of precious metals, spe spices, and land. The letter targeted the merchants and business people of Europe in a, in a hope to attract their interest and money. The letter provoked a great deal of interest in the new lands. They set a scramble of competition for colonies and land in the new lands across the sea. Spain and Portugal became an instant rivals for overseas possessions. This fever eventually effect infected the French, the English, and the Dutch, among others. The competition led to wars, conquests, and an unprecedented migration of colonists from the old world to the new. It also led to the decimation, annihilation, and subjugation of native Amerindian inhabitants. Next week, I will conclude the story of Christopher Columbus. He undertook three more voyages to the New World. After Christopher Columbus, I will relate the story of the next important to set the stage for eventual English colonial settlement in the New World, John Cabot. 
Find out more about the colonial history of the United States by purchasing the book Colonial American History Stories 1215 through 1664. The book is a timeline of events from Christopher Columbus to 1664. You can find it on my website, www.mossyfeetbooks, on the timeline of United States history category. Just scroll down the categories, click that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, click down to that category and click it and you'll see all the books in the series. There are links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Play, and other online booksellers. You may choose to purchase the book in ebook or softbound versions. An audiobook version is available on Google Play. At the conclusion of this series, I'll compile the episode into an audiobook. The audiobook will be available on Audible, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, as well as many other audiobook sellers. You can find this podcast on Apple, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, TuneIn, and many other podcast platforms. I publish a video version onto YouTube and Rumble. You can also find my books if you live in southeastern Indiana at the Walnut Street Variety Shop on George Street in Batesville. You can also order these books direct from me, the author, on the webpage. If you wish me to sign a book, just send an email to mossyfeetbooks at gmail.com requesting a signed book and instructions on how you want me to address it. Note, if you send me an email, I will add you to my contact list. Readers on the list will receive an email from me announcing when I publish a new book. If you do not want to add me to add you to the list, tell me and I will not add you. Listeners to this podcast that want email notifications of my new releases can just send me an email requesting, requesting addition to the list. You can choose to have your name removed at any time. If you browse the website, you will find dozens of sample chapters, one for each of my books. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and thank you for listening.